Okay, thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to be here and to uh, see old friends and uh, colleagues. So, so thank you. So I'd like to talk about the elbow because it's a joint that most people don't see that much in their day-to-day -day practice. Um, I hardly ever, if ever, give a knee lecture, almost never give a shoulder lecture because most people feel reasonably comfortable with that. But you see it often enough that you probably need to know it. The other reason why I like to speak about the elbow is it's a really good model for looking at other joints and for helping to understand other joints. And we'll speak of that in reference to joint fluid in a minute. So as a general rule, most joints, we should distinguish between internal derangement and an external derangement. An internal derangement is something that can be seen and potentially addressed by arthroscopy. An external derangement is something that's occult to arthroscopy. And the best way to distinguish internal and external derangements is the presence of abnormal joint. And we're going to get to that too in a second. So in the elbow, when we talk about internal derangement, we're talking about disorders of cartilage, bone, or intra-articular bodies that emanate from disorders of cartilage or bone. When we talk about external derangement, we're talking about ligaments, nerves, and tendons. And in tendons in the elbow is epicondylitis, flexor, and extensor tendons, as well as distal biceps and triceps. The two ligaments we're going to speak about are the lateral on the collateral ligaments and the medial collateral ligaments. Now I give a lot of lectures, including several times very pleasurable in Egypt, and I almost never speak about normal variants when giving a lecture. I'm of the firm belief that imagers and radiologists can intuitively understand what a normal variant is. You look at the you know, a clinician comes up and shows you a film, and you say, don't worry about that, that's normal. Uh, we all do this a hundred times a year, and probably at least one time a day. But sometimes, normal variants look very striking to the eye. And later this afternoon, we're going to speak about marrow, and there's several of those variants in marrow. And some of them we see in the elbow here, where we see red marrow in the proximal radial diaphragm. Since proximal radial fractures may be a pulse, that's a normal variant to consider. The other normal variant, another normal variant, is this crevice in the semilunar fossa of the ulna. The ulna embryologically is made up of two halves that come together. When they come together, you can get a little divot, as demonstrated here. That's not an osteochondral defect. That's a normal variant. Another normal variant that looks like an osteochondral defect is the posterior capital. And the way to distinguish that from pathology is with one exception, which we'll end this talk with. All capital disorders are anterior, not posterior. So as a general rule, if you see something in the capital and posteriorly it's normal, and if you see something anteriorly, it's out. Now the last variant we speak about is the fascicles of the tricep. Tomorrow we'll speak about tendons in, in detail. And part of that detail, we'll be discussing how a tendon is organized, and it's organized through fascicles. So microscopically, all tendons have fascicles. But visually, few tendons are possible. 
the rotating half stars, the super banana stars, the Achilles stars, and the tricep. And we'll talk about why you see that tomorrow, so please come back. But that is a normal variant. And the other. And here's a case that I just saw last week. Patient came in to rule out an occult fracture, and we see this edema in the uh, proximal radius, and that's just normal red right action. That's not a normal fracture. So let's begin with internal derangements. But we'll speak about effusions momentarily. Because that's the way, when you look at a film, you start looking for an internal array. So it's cartilage, a subtimes the bone, or a combination of the two, and the prototype of an internal derangement is joint fluid. Now how much joint fluid is, is, is abnormal? Um, I do my clinical work at a big hospital in Detroit, the biggest, um, called Henry Ford Hospital. And they have a template for dictation. Most of you probably have templates for dictation. And, and the template drives me crazy. Because there's a line in the template that says, no joint flow in the sink. Everyone has some joint flow. You know, as, as, as they should say, no abnormal joint flow, with no excessive joint flow. It seems. So I have to go there and hand edit every single report. Not just elbow, every single report says, no joint fluid to see. So a small amount of joint fluid is normal. So how much is a small amount? So if you think back to medical school and you have a slide and you put a cover slip on that slide before looking under a microscope, people remember that? Yes, I hope I did. And you put a few drops of water on the slide and then a cover slip. And then the water will spread via capillary action, right? Remember, capillary action. That's normal flow. A thin layer between bones is what you should see. Now if I put, rather than one or two drops, five, six, seven, or eight drops, the water would pool around the cover slip. I guess there's too much water there. And pooling around the cover slip is going into joint recesses. So if we start seeing fluid in this posterior recess where we see fat bands, or the anterior recess, or the annular recess, that's our moment. So in the elbow and in every other joint, if I see fluid in recesses, that's a sign of abnormality. Now when you look at this fluid, this is not nice looking fluid. It's not only too much. It looks dirty. It looks heterogeneous. And when you look at joint fluid, we distinguish between gland diffusions, boring, plain, simple fluid without blood or protein, or lymphocytes or anything and it's dirty fluid which has blood and lymphocytes and high albumin and when you have dirty fluid think of either a hemorrhagic effusion from trauma or another cause or infection or inflammation when you have a clean effusion then think of cartilage defects and osteopathy so does this look clean or dirty Third, so you got to think, is this septic arthritis? And it was septic arthritis. Okay, so if we look at these patients, this is a clean effusion. This is kind of an eh. Could be a little bit inflammatory, I'm not sure. And here we see synovial proliferation. I'm going to show you this case again a little bit. So what are our criteria for a dirty effusion? Fluid should normally be hypo-intense to muscle on a T1 way event. If it's not, that's a sign of blood or growth. It should be the brightest thing on your image on a T2 way event. Like vein veins are usually the brightest thing. So it should be look like a vein on a T2 way event. It should be homogeneous. It should be bland, boring, nothing to see. Here. It should have no visible synovia. Let's go back to medical school. How many layers is synovial? How many cell layers? Two. Two. You can't see two cell layers with the naked eye. So there's a paper written by a guy who used to work with me, Orlando Singsong, great name, Singsong, uh, that was called the visible synovial sign, the sign of synovial proliferation. So if you see synovium, that's abnormal. 
if you see fluid or edema adjacent to the bone, that's up. Now these rules are not just for the elbow, they're for every joint. So we look here, the fluid is not the brightest thing on the image compared to the fluid between the joints. It's heterogeneous. It's got visible synovium, right? We can see the synovium. And it's got every synovial edema. So it has every sign of a dirty effusion. This could be septic. This could be rheumatoid arthritis. This could be hemorrhagic. But it can't be from an OCD. It can't be from a college. It can't be from a subacute fracture. And then there's the parfait sign. Do you know what a parfait is? So you go to an ice cream store, they put ice cream, and then some chocolate syrup, and then whipped cream. That's a parfait. And then you have a glass and you can see where the ice cream stops. So if you look here, we have one signal intensity. Then on T2, we have another signal intensity. Then we have the third layer. So you see the three layers? And that's the parfait sign, and that's another sign of a dirty or a heterogeneous joint. Now we said embryologically, the olecranon comes in as two pieces, right? And that's what you see the crevice. The synopium of the elbow comes in as three pieces. Kind of three balloons that come together. And you can see the remnant of the when the two balloons come together. And in the knee we call those Plica. And in the elbow we call them Plica. Same. Plica. Except we're just not used to seeing them. And the elbow, because they're a little bit subtle. So if I told you this was the tibia and this was the femur, and I said this is the posterior horn of the medial meniscus, like Mohammed's previous presentation, and he called this a meniscal contusion with a little bit of signal inside the meniscus, you probably would believe me even though this is an elbow, and or not a knee elbow. And that, so if it looks like a meniscus, it's normal. That's a normal synovial remnant. If you see something posteriorly here, that's also a synovial remnant, not normal. We'll get to that in a second. So, this is the normal one, looks like a meniscus. The posterior one and the medial one, the one by the annular recess, are abnormal. They're still remnants, but if you see them, it means they're thickened and hypertrophy, and they lock and tap. So let's go back here. This was a professional baseball pitcher, and he was trying to wind up, and he couldn't wind up. It stopped. And I called that a body. When I was at Jefferson, I was wrong. They took him to surgery. Uh, the surgeon calls me up and goes, Mark, I got some good news and some bad news for you. So I go, well, give me the bad news first. He goes, well, that professional baseball player that you pulled a body on never had a body. And I felt like this tall. <laughs> and he goes, well, the good news is he needed arthroscopy anyway because he had a plica back there mimicking a body and cause the cash. Mm -hmm. um, so the posterior plica causes this thing called posterior impingement. We'll get to that in a second. Now there's synovium in the joint and there's synovium in bursa. And there's several bursae in the elbow, not as many as the knee, but some in the elbow. The two ones that we think of, one is posterior, called the olecranon bursa, that I'm banging right now, and the other one by your bicep tendon between your radius and the ulna, and that's called your bicipital radialis. In all bursitis, loss of subcutaneous fat between the bursa and the skin is a sign of bursitis, whether it be the foot, the ankle, the elbow, the wrist, anywhere. Good sign. And just like in joint fluid, we want to see clean and dirty fluid, we want to see clean and dirty bursal fluid. And that will help us on a differential diagnosis. So if you look here, this is pretty clean fluid, right? It's pretty bright on T2, right? Certainly as bright as a vein is. Pretty homogeneous, no visible synovium. So this will be bland or sight. If I look at this one, excuse me, this is 
heterogeneous, but a lot of perisynovial edema. And you can see the visible synovial sign. So you would think of gout, infectious, rheumatoid arthritis, and then this was gout. Another case, this is post-contrast, this is T2. And typically, the outer aspect of the enhancement is less defined than the inner aspect of it. But again, this looks like inflammatory bursitis in this one. Infectious. Now, the bicipital radialis bursa is seen here. The proximal biceps has a tendency. The distal biceps does not. Fluid at the distal biceps is termed the bicipital radialis bursa. And it cushions your biceps as you permeate in super. So it kind of protects, it's kind of an air bag around the biceps as you pronate and supinate. And typically fluid there, common association, distal biceps, partial, not completely. And this is clean fluid, distal biceps, clean fluid. Um, this is post-contrast, this is T2, this is the distal biceps. We see the filling defects, we see the filling defects here. This is just a great case. Not for lecture, just for intellect. This was synovial osteochromatosa of the bicep tendon. And this is another great case. So this is the bicep tendon. And you see this is a T1 weighted image. And you see how the fluid is iso intense to muscle on a T1 weighted image. That should never be the case. On a T2 weighted image, this is not simple fluid. We have a vein here. And the, the, the stuff in the bicep tendon sheath is not isotestable. So this is rheumatoid arthritis, and this is all panis formation from rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, so when you have joint load, the first thing you should think of, well, the first nine things, is cartilage. And cartilage loss is both easy and hard in the elbow. Easy because it only occurs in two places. Hard because you can't see them. So the two places it occurs is the anterior aspect of the capitella. And remember we said all capitella disorders with one minor exception are anterior. So cartilage loss is going to be anterior. And the radial. Really, if you're going to do arthroscopy, you're going to look at 100 arthroscopy reports. 99 of them are going to have all the shorts in those two locations. Now it's really hard to see the small joints. So what we look for is subchondral marrow edema. And if we see subchondral marrow edema, you know there's going to be cartilage loss there, even if you can't see maybe that the cartilage. And the other thing you look for is nearby osteophytes. And if you see nearby osteophytes, then also likely it is cartilage. So cartilage loss, the most common reason to have a joint diffusion, that joint diffusion is going to be clean, homogeneous, no visible synovium. And it's going to occur in two places, the anterior aspect of the capitella and the radial. Now, you can also get bone and cartilage loss together. We call those osteochondral defects or lesions. And they occur in one location, capitella, and again, anterior in the capitella. Most common place to get osteochondral defects is the knee, followed by the tailor dome, followed by the capitella. And here's a patient, the defect is gone, it's an empty hole, and we see the underlying marrow edema. Another patient, defect is gone, but we see it in the annular recess. So bodies go to recesses. Everywhere in the body, the elbow is a prototype. So it'll go to the annular recess or the anterior and posterior humeral recess. So that brings us to bodies. That's where you look for them. If you have critical suspicion for a body, do a gradient echo image with a TEU greater than five. Now, one thing I pound into my fellows is don't call them loose 
product. Intra-articular is not the same as both. Most of them are packed on synovium like Velcro. Understand Velcro? Like sneakers. So it's like stuck on synovium like Velcro. And in fact, at surgery, you have to cut that synovium to get it off. You can't just pull the body in. So they're not loose. They're intra-articular with some exceptions. And they usually begin as cartilage and they grow. They sometimes begin as cartilage and bone, but not typically. So here's an MRRogram and an intra-articular body by the tip of the olecranon. And again, this is going to give you this hyperextension and picture. Let's we'll think about that momentarily. Another elbow, T1, T2, intra-articular body. Here we see it in the posterior urethral recess. So this brings us now to posterior picture. And a lot of students confuse adhesive capsulitis or fibrosing capsulitis and impingement because they both cause limitation of motion. But adhesive capsulitis causes limitation of motion in all directions and impingement causes it in more directions. So all over the body, impingement, you have a block at one direction, and adhesive capsulitis, you have a block at all. And you name that impingement, either for where the block is anatomically, and we're going to speak about that in my second lecture, or by the vector, the direction you're going. So in the elbow, you could call this hyperextension impingement, because it occurs when you extend. Or well, posterior impingement, because anatomically, the block is posterior. Either of those conventions is acceptable. Now, you can get this when you have a SOLTA-1 fracture, typically a stress fracture in throwing athletes. This was a little league picture. You can get it from thick and pleca, like I showed you. You can get it from posterior bodies in that recess, which I also showed you. Or you can get it from osteoporosis. Now, clinically, we differentiate, we meaning other people who practice clinical medicine, the chronic and mechanical impingement from someone who just wakes up and can't move their elbow in that direction. But most of these are chronic, very few of them are acute, and I think that that's a species. Um, here is a large body. You see the body? Yes. Causing impingement. Here's an osteophyte. Causing impingement. A lot of osteophytes in that elbow. And here's that plica that we showed you earlier. Causing posterior impingement. And another salt of one. Okay, that's internal derangement. Now we've got about 20 minutes to speak about external derangements. And external derangements will not provoke a joint effusion. So um, Bill Morrison, who was second or third fellow, um, one thing he said, which I think is a very clever thing, when I look at any MR, the first thing I do is, is there a joint Because if there's a joint effusion, I go down this pathway. And if there's not a joint effusion, I go down that pathway. I think it's, it's a pretty good thing to do. So if there's no joint diffusion, we're going to go down the tendon, ligament, uh, pathway. And here is a normal ulnar nerve that kind of looks like a, a heart. So remember, epicondylitis is a mystery. It is a tendon disorder like any other tendon disorder. And like when we say a patient has rotated cuff degeneration, a patient has a partial rotated cuff tear, a patient has a full thickness rotator the cuff tear. A patient has a full thickness tear with retraction. You do the exact same. Um, so here's a patient who has abnormal signal on T1, abnormal signal on T2, not as bright as forward. And if this is a shoulder, you would call it tendinopathy. And if it's an elbow, we call it tendinopathy. Some people might call it epidontolitis. So here is a T2-weighted image in a different patient, and we see fluid. And it's not a 
involving all the tendons. It's involving one of the tendons. And if it was the shoulder, it would be the supraspinatus, and you would say a fourth of this supraspinatus. There, and we say the same thing in the other. And someone here has fluid involving all the tendons, a little bit of retraction, right? And if this is a shoulder, we would call this a large rotating cuff tail with a small amount of retraction. And this is a large, this would be medial tendon there with a lot of retraction, small amount of retraction. Now, Use sagittal images also. If you see epicondus lies really well on sagittal images, but more importantly, you'll see the retraction or the absence of retraction. And here you can see the tear, but no retraction. So use sagittal images for epicondylitis. And just we differentiate medial and lateral epicondylitis, tennis versus golfers, I point out, that would be kind of stupid. Um, here it is on the radial side, tennis, and here it is on the ulnar side, um, golfers. But they're the same thing in tendon disorders like any other tendon disorder. Now, tendon disorders in the elbow and many parts of the body, the shoulder and the ankle and the wrist, get associated subchondral malignity <coughs> next to the tendon disorder. And those patients who get this have more acute pain. So it's a pretty good marker for them. So here they have a complete tear, right, on the axle mm -hmm. images and they have adjacent matter edema. So they'll have dysfunction and pain. And not just at the elbow. You can use this, as I said in the beginning of the talk, the elbow's a good um, model for other articulations. So we did flexors and extensors, epicondylitis. The next tendon we're gonna do is the biceps. Now bicep tears occur proximally or distal. And proximal is far more common. Proximal is more common in women. Distal is more common in men. So much more common in men that orthopedic surgeons have a little joke where they say the risk of a woman, sorry, the risk, better now? Yeah. Yes. The risk of a woman getting a distal bicep tendon tear is roughly the same as the risk of her having testicular tear. So that should teach you that distal bicep tears are almost always Now what happens is you pronate and supinate, you pronate and supinate, and you gradually degrade your bicep. So distal bicep tears don't occur in young people. They occur, they say, early middle age. And what happens is you get forced flexion on an extended arm. Now the first of these I saw was a colleague of mine who had a case of beer in his hands. And he slipped. And the case of beer was about to fall. And this gentleman didn't want the beer to fall. And he pulled back. And he threw his butt. So forced flexion on an extended arm. And here you see it. Here's the distal biceps coming into the radius, and here's a partial tear of the distal biceps. Now, most tendon tears occur in zones of hypovascular. The Achilles doesn't tear at the insertion, and it tears, uh, tears a few centimeters from the insertion, because that's the avascular. The body, the rotator cuff, tends to occur in three millimeters from the footprint, because that's the hypovascular. So this is the hypovascular zone for the biceps distal. Okay, I don't have a slide ahead of here. So we'll compare and contrast proximal and distal bicep there. Proximal is what gender more? Female. Distal is male. Which is more common? Proximal much more common than distal. Which goes to surgery after a long period of time? <laughs> proximal. And which goes to surgery acutely? Distal. 
there's only two tendon tears in the body that the orthopedic surgeon comes back from the weekend to operate. Rotator cuff tears can wait. Achilles tears can wait. Posterior tibial tears can wait. But pectoralis and distal bicep tears cannot wait. If you wait three days, then you repair it. So, proximal biceps can wait. Distal biceps can wait. Proximal biceps, almost invariable association with rotator cuff tears. Distal biceps, no association with any other thing. Distal biceps associated by simple radialis bursitis. Proximal biceps, no bursitis associated with it. Distal biceps, systemic diseases, lupus, particularly steroids. Proximal biceps, just aging. Another orthopedic joke is that you, if a person has a distal bicep tendon tear and denies being on anabolic steroids, they're lying. Very high association with steroids, particularly anabolic steroids. <coughs> now let's talk about the two ligaments in the elbow. So external derangement, flexors and extensor tendons, epicondylitis, bicep tendons, and we'll get to triceps in a moment and medial lateral collateral ligaments. Medial collateral ligament is a chronic injury, rarely occurs acutely. It occurs in overhead throwing athletes, mostly from overuse. So it gets thickened and has internal signal within it. So here's the medial collateral ligament, thickened and irregular, notice physiologic joint fluid. Here's a medial collateral ligament tear, off of the sublime tubercle of the ulna, and he has fluid violating where that tear is. He has another tear, MR orthogram, the contrast is getting into the ligament, and that's called the T sign, because it looks like a T on its side. So the fluid that gets in there looks like a T that's been rotated 90 degrees. That's very classic for bicep for medial collateral ligament tears, which are usually partial. And another medial collateral ligament tear here. Thickened chronic medial collateral ligament, no fluid in it. Now the lateral ulnar collateral ligament, the second most common ligament tore in the elbow. Medial collateral ligament, athletes, throwing athletes, chronic injury. Lateral ulnar collateral ligaments, old people, no, it's an acute episode, but no real injury often associated with it. Medial collateral ligament, men, just because they play more throwing sports than women, no other reason. Lateral ulnar collateral ligament, women, more than that. So here's lateral on the collateral ligament, usually off of the ulna. There's an association with severe epicondylitis, and here's disruption of the lateral on the collateral ligament. Another disruption of the lateral on the collateral ligament, and a partial disruption of the lateral on the collateral ligament. Multi-ligament tears. Another orthopedic axiom is if you tear any two ligaments in a joint, unless it's the MCL and the ACL in the knee, that's a joint dislocation until proven over. And in fact, in the orthopedic literature, you can call this a joint dislocation even without documentation at an end. So here we have a lateral ulnar collateral ligament injury. Here we have a medial collateral ligament injury. It's a bad looking MRI because people have dislocated their elbows don't have to cooperate that way. Another medial collateral ligament injury and lateral ulnar collateral ligament injury dislocated elbow. Now there's two types 
of instability that we should mention. And I regret that I don't have more time to go into it. Of course, it is important. The more common is posterior lateral rotatory instability. And the less common, but still frequent, is posterior medial rotatory instability. Now, both of these fall into that spectrum of multi-ligament tears and with dislocations that spontaneously reduce. And the way to distinguish that is the lateral has an abnormal radial head. Medial has an abnormal coronoid process. So radial head, bone bruises lateral, the coronoid process, medial. And medial is men, and lateral is women. So I have to simplify this. If I see the radial head, posterior lateral rotatory instability. If I see the coronoid, posterior medial rotatory instability. I'm happy to share this slide. It's kind of an important slide when looking at these patients, but it's not at all uncommon. Okay. Let's do triceps, or we'll do partial biceps there. So partial biceps there are older patients, older than distal complete biceps that are there, no acute injury. So another orthopedic joke, I'll give you all my orthopedic jokes, is a, where is an orthopedic surgeon vacation? Right On a bone island. So when you have a complete biceps tear, it looks like a first year medical student took your blood. So you get this hematoma here, that's an orthopedic, like a first year medical student took your blood. So if a patient comes in with biceps symptoms and no hematoma, you think of a partial biceps tear. So here's a partial bicep tear. Can you see the signal? Partial in the bicep tendon. Not surgical, chronic, and association with bicipital radialis personal. Partial bicep tear here. Okay, triceps tears, they're surprisingly uncommon. So the triceps makes up two thirds of your upper arm mass. So men, if you want to get bigger arms, you don't do curls, you do reverse curls. Because the triceps is two thirds of your upper arm mass. Most people tear the triceps are on cortical steroids. Biceps, anabolic steroids. Triceps, cortical steroids and association with inflammatory arthropathies, particularly lupus. So they can be partial as seen here, or complete as seen here. And we'll talk this afternoon about edema. Very little edema associated with tricep tests. And this afternoon we'll speak about why. And here's another complete bicep. I know a friend who went for the gym for the first time and he hold the bar. Getting up with the bar, he tore both biceps. Bicep. Going down, he tore both biceps. And from the first try, he had both arms with two biceps. And, and twice. of course, the last time never go to the gym again. Yes. <laughs> okay, we're going to finish up with the ulnar nerve. Um, ulnar nerve cubital tunnel syndrome is very, very common. The treatment is to move the ulnar nerve away from it so it's no longer superficial. The abnormalities that we see are one, lack of surrounding fats, two, enlargement, three, edema, but that edema must be in three slices or less. If the edema is on more than three slices, 
that's a normal variant. And we look for an accessory muscle for the Anconius epitropheitis. So here is the normal on the nerve, no bright signal on T2. And here is the ulnar nerve, right signal on T2, and an adjacent muscle. Can you see the adjacent muscle? That's Anconius epitropliaris, and that's a cause of cubital tunnel syndrome. Ulnar nerve enlarged and edematous. Ulnar nerve glomosides and edematous. And also, you can get other causes of nerve entrapment, particularly pin, posterior interosseous nerve entrapment, where we see the muscle denervation aspects of that as demonstrated here. Now, the last thing I want to talk about in the remaining one minute is epitropheal lymph nodes. Popliteal lymph nodes in the knee are of no importance. Inward or lymph nodes in the hip are little to no importance. This epitropeal lymph node is very important. It's a sign of cryptic elbow pain from a rickettsial infection. I'm from Detroit. There's a famous musician from Detroit who had a song called Cat Scratch Fever. It was Ted Nugent. And this is typically Cat Scratch Fever. One of the few things on imaging where you can give like the exact diagnosis. So this is T1, T2, and post contrast, and I think I have another example here. I see it, it's maybe once a year. So in the elbow, we talked about distinguishing internal derangements from external derangements. And we say the first thing to look for is joint flow. And to look for is that joint flow clean, homogeneous, very bright on T2, less bright than muscle on T1, no visible synovium, gland diffusion, cartilage loss, anterior capitellum, and radial hernia. Maybe an osteochondral defect, anterior capitellum. If there's no joint flow, we think about external derangements. Flexors and extenders, epicondylitis, biceps and triceps, and remember biceps distal men, anabolic steroids, triceps catabolic steroids, typical steroids, lupus and other inflammatory properties. We said medial collateral ligaments, throwing athletes, chronic injury, lateral ulnar collateral ligaments, older individuals, more of an acute injury, multiple ligaments, dislocations, think of posterior lateral or posterior medial rotatory instability, far more common than you might believe that to be. And then we ended with a thought. Again, I'm honored to be here. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much for the perfect story of course. This is very really nice to be here for one of the most difficult joints to be interesting in the past. And uh, now I think we uh, need uh, uh, to have a big question because the price is very uh, high uh, for the floor uh, and there are three questions for the speaker. It is a question for Professor Amazani. Uh, <coughs> I think um, 
I've learned, you know, there's an, uh, when I treat fellows now, there's an expression I use. Never trust anyone's old reading, even your own. Uh, because if you read things the same way 10 years ago as you do now, something is wrong. We should all get a little better over time. And I, I, I've learned from looking at arthroscopy reports and speaking that bodies most of the time aren't loose, and I, and I should have not called out this. And uh, I, I demonstrated to kind of confirm that finding and, and sometimes, you're 100% right, that's, that's a bleaker. And, and, and it was pretty obvious on that image, I agree. But sometimes you catch them, and they, and they do look like a little ball. Like, like, a, like a rounded body. But you're 100% right. The second version, in the invention of the other man, there is a, an energy you wrote, and the track around the, 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 the nerve is quite well. And there is no signs of compression that can I uh, rely on. I don't know. If, is it? Is it? Yeah. So, so the ulnar nerve is the top nerve um, because it's a pretty common disorder, and I think our sensitivity has been low. We've missed it. But on the flip side, as you intimated correctly, if we move down our sensitivity our specificity is, if we move up our sensitivity, our specificity is going to go down. Yeah, yeah. So I think there are nerves that they operate on that have normal fat around them, many, many. Nerves. But if you said everyone who has normal fat had a normal nerve, you'd be missing a fair amount of that normal nerve. Because uh, of the elbow surgeries outside of trauma, and my current feature about 10% of the normal nerve, Translocations. So they're moving a lot of around. Uh, so, uh, the last question uh, regarding the collateral tips are we, uh, are we uh, misleading the term of if condylitis associated with the collateral uh, ligament tips? Because uh, you said it is associated with the condylitis. The collateral ligament? Yeah, but it is accepted that we call it there. Uh, it's chronic epicondylitis, and I'm going to speak about this when I speak about tendons. You get all these inflammatory substances around them, and they have an effect on the adjacent tissue. So you'll get um, ligament tears with tendon tears and tendon tears with ligament tears. Thank you very much. Dr. Martin, uh, you know, it's one of the most difficult of pediatric patients, particularly in the pediatric in the group we like to get us what is your role in this case. And yet, both of the traumatic airports in this case. So, I have a question for you. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, it is one of our tests. Yeah. Um, joints, they don't get MR that frequently, and they probably shouldn't. Um, so, when we, we're going to talk about MARA for this afternoon. I think you should distinguish between marrow disorders if, that if you don't treat them, things go bad, versus marrow disorders that if you don't treat them, you know, God will fix it on, on their own. You don't have to do anything about it. So like a skateboard fracture, you got to do something because if you don't, something will go bad. But most elbow fractures, as long as they're not displaced, we'll do okay. And most elbow, elbow disorders will probably do okay. I'll speak a little bit about that, I think, this afternoon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the reception. Uh, I uh, have the case of recurrent constant problem in the epiproptic region. Gave me I performed a sort of prostate system and we put a mess uh, about the end. Uh, did you see this uh, event before? Did you uh, face this case uh, of the current performance in the same way you in the epiprotein report? And it was, was an infection? Uh, no, it was an infection to the current recurrent prostate report. Oh, the problem after, 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 yeah. 20, after 20 years. And it was a very rare uh, for me at the I have not, and that's not a common lymph node to get um, lymphoma. Yeah. 
Thank you. 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 Thank you.